Hey everyone, welcome back. So today we'll be talking a lot about different kinds of, like a little bit about filtering, uh, but mostly actually about aggregation methods. Very simple ones from histograms to fancy ones like TC. Um, first, um, as you all probably know, uh, your project deadline is this Friday. Um, a couple of words about that. First, uh, you need to hand this in by Friday. There is no extensions. You cannot uh, like submit it later. The reason why we are so strict about this is because uh, we need to grade this uh, by Monday. Um, so we kind of really like what we do on Monday is we pick the best project. It doesn't mean that we're done all with grading, but we'll have looked at every single project by Monday. Um, and then we have one long meeting um, where we look at every single project together as a team, all the TAs and me, um, and then we pick the best projects. Um, and like the best projects, the runner-ups, the honorable mentions, uh, and so on. And that's kind of like great for you to be in the pile because essentially if we pick you at that stage, you're already guaranteed to get more than the maximum of points. Um, so. To do that, like a couple of tips, like you know this, but I'm just going to say it anyways just to avoid that anybody, it, that, that there are any surprises. So for your final project submission, like the one important thing is like uh, we will, there's a fixed rubric, right? So if you don't submit the process book, you lose those points, even if your project is amazing. Uh, if you don't submit the video, you lose those points. So this is the easiest way to really lose a lot of points on projects by not looking at the formality. Um, and so these formalities include the process book where you really describes, uh, describe what you've done and your reasoning and your justification behind it. Um, then of course your code. Um, we, like, this is all on GitHub so that's kind of obvious. You have to have a project website. So basically we recommend that you just publish a GitHub page um, where you describe your project, where you link to your video, your, where you link to your process book, where you put your names and so on. Uh, this is fairly simple to set up, um, and we might make exceptions for some people who have like um, private data. Uh, but generally, like the publishing of this website shouldn't be a lot of effort. You just like um, click one checkbox on GitHub. But even if you have private data, you should create this website. Um, then, very important is the project screencast. Uh, the project screencast is like a two-minute screencast with narration. So like just talk over what you're doing. You, you can create like a slide deck for the first like 30 seconds to give us a little bit of background, but mostly we expect you to walk us through your tool and show us the cool things that it can do. Um, and this is like particularly important for the like evaluation for best project. So if you're thinking you have a great project, you should really put effort into this because this is really what we will be like looking at as a team. So this is what where we start off with. We look at all the videos, um, and then if there's questions, we explore the tool, and the TA who's responsible for your project will actually look at the rest of the code and the process book and so on in detail. Yeah? How important is it that it's two minutes exactly? If it's like two minutes, 30 seconds, is that acceptable? Or? Yes, but don't test our patience. <laughs> <laughs> so don't submit like five minute videos, right? And also, don't, like, it's, it's fairly easy to do those things with modern computers. Just make sure that you don't have extremely noisy or extremely, uh, an extremely noisy environment or something very quiet. And make, make sure you narrate it um, so that we really get what your project is about. And then there's finally this peer assessment, and this is going to be a Google form uh, that we send out that's going to be, like, probably, like, that's not part of your submission. Um, but we'll send this out probably like at the end of the week um, where we want you to give feedback on your colleagues, uh, kind of like reflect a little bit on how you did in the project, how much you contributed. Um, and I assume that this is going to be fine for everybody or for most people. Uh, like usually that we don't actually change points between group members, but like one or two cases a year we have usually where there is like some, like let's say, unhappiness within the group. Uh, and there's different opinions, and then we have to look at that because, like, it's teamwork. But we also want everybody to pull their own weight. So, if you've been, if you had a teammate who's been slacking off, this is the way to reflect that. Um, ideally, you should have like talked to your TA or to me about major problems um, by by this time already. Uh, so I haven't heard anything that's great. Um, so, any other questions about the project? <coughs> 
Okay, if not, then let's talk about uh, filtering in ad navigation. So, um, filtering is really like both of those, uh, both of those uh, ideas are really about kind of like dealing with large data to some degree. So filtering is about reducing items based on some criteria or reducing attributes. And aggregation uh, is about summarizing items or attributes. So we'll start out with filtering. So if, when we filter data, we eliminate, uh, we eliminate um, some of the values. So what drives those filters? And the answer to that is any possible functions that partitions a data set into two sets. So it could be something as simple as bigger or smaller than x in a dimension, or like a twofold change between two dimension, or it could be some complicated function that you apply across multiple dimension. Uh, it can be essentially anything um, that, that, you, uh, that you define as a filter. Um, and we talked about dynamic queries and filtering when we talked about interactions. So I'm going to revisit this briefly here. Um, so dynamic queries is when we couple between the encoding and in the, act, in the interaction so that the user can immediately see the results of an action. So it's like what I said earlier, like with an arbitrary complex function, that's not very immediate, right? I have to write a function somehow um, that, that is evaluated and then some of the elements are removed. It's much more tangible if I have like a slider on the axis of a parallel coordinates that, that, that directly removes yeah. elements. Um, also, it's important, like it's, it's interesting to think about the difference between queries and filters, right? Because that's not completely obvious. If you think about those two operations, they're very similar. So queries are like something where you start with zero and write an expression or do something to add in elements. And filters is when you start with everything and you remove elements. And so when you choose a query or uh, a filter, that depends a little bit on the size of your data set. Like if you have an immense data set, you uh, probably want to go query first. But, but on the other hand, if you want to have an overview of your data set, and you can reasonably render an overview of a data set, you might want to start with all elements and remove them first, like this classical overview first, um, zoom and filter details on demand paradigm. So the approach here depends really on the data set size. Um, I want to talk a little bit about queries. So, um, who has I used mean, uh, LaTeX before? Okay, and do you know time. all the codes for the fancy math symbols that you need to? No. So, like, one, like we have a mental model of like what a pattern could look like in the data, or of what a glyph or like a symbol in, in LaTeX could look like, and we can just like yeah. sketch it. Um, there is this tool here. Yeah, now we need to secure the shit out of this thing. Where I can draw, and it will find the matching symbols. Uh, and now you can actually copy it. Uh, like if you're in math mode, uh, you can use, use these different like uh, lowercase pi, uh, uppercase pi, and so on. And I can try to do. Sigma, um, and you like basically, and you can see that this is kind of like fuzzy, right? We we have this is not a perfect sigma that I drew here. It's on a, on a trackpad, um, but it does work fairly well. And so this kind of like like this is very like I use this uh, all the time when I want to look for uh, for things in in, in uh, latte. You can do things as simple as different dashes, for example, here. Um, but you could kind of extend that idea to sketching patterns in data. So let's suppose I have a line chart um, and I want to see, let's say, stock, a line chart of stock market trends and I want to see like a massive crash. So I could sketch like something going up like this and then down. And this is exactly what this tool here does. Um, so this has been around for a while um, like, and these kind of sketching based interfaces have been around and they, they are very useful. Uh, but this paper here from Kai of 2018, so Kai this year, um, really like also won a best paper award. Um, really does a great job um, at like understanding what users actually mean when they sketch. So here are kind of like a couple of examples. 
this is what the, the pattern that they're looking for, and this is how users in like a preliminary study sketch those patterns. And so they kind of used again this principle of uh, asking people to emulate a pattern and then understanding what do users draw, what are the abstractions uh, to really uh, make that uh, work in practice. And so here is like a two different examples, here like a, a trough and here like an increased uh, curve. Um, and there's like a nice video that I want to show for this. There's all the captions. This is from an early example, this, this hill finder um, approach. So we talked about this. Um, here we have these kind of like widgets, these um, WIMP widgets that I can like manipulate to, for example, here refine, like start from length 0 to 450 minutes for movies uh, to be somewhere between like these bounds. I don't actually know what the bounds here are exactly. Um, so, um, we can kind of like do this better, and we had this exercise about the uh, home finder, if you remember, about this, um, where we kind of like try to add some information uh, on top of these widgets. And the idea of that was in this scented widgets, uh, widgets paper from Wes Willett uh, in 2007. Um, and so here, they augment simple widgets with visualizations of the underlying data, so that you have a little bit of a sense of what is going on if, or what you can expect if you and manipulate those widgets in some way. So here they have different examples of having like little bar charts or histograms on top of, um, of this slider here, having stars next to these options, uh, having like color coding for the, the size of the data set, um, and having um, number of edits for, the, for these trees. And so they kind of talk about this in a quite uh, generic way. And so here, is like, um, I also showed this tool, I think, when we talked about, I don't know when the mouse was not here. This is annoying. Uh, we talked about this tool when I talked about multiple coordinate views, and it's kind of like an um, uh, an example of how, how you could use those scented widgets um, to filter. So here we have a data set of medals won in the Olympic Games from 2000 to 2012. Um, we have different perspectives on this, like how many medals were awarded in athletics, in rowing, in swi swimming, in football, in hockey, in ice hockey, in handball, um, and so on. And by countries, so you can see that the United States won uh, one point, like 1,100 um, medals, and Russia won 706. Um, and so then we have like these, these, these histograms here, they're not only histograms, but they're also scented widgets. So I can basically manipulate them as filters. If it doesn't, it works. Yeah. Um, 
and we immediately like get a sense of like, well, if we if we brush in this space here, we're not going to exclude too many things, but if we actually brush in this space here, we will actually include a fair number of things. Um, I can also like drill down uh, into like filter by selecting individual items here, uh, or by like so here. Let's say we we look at what are like, the very young athletes who won that. And there we see like there's a 20 year hockey player who won a gold medal or uh, bronze medal in 2000. Uh, in 2000. Um, you can kind of extend this idea to interactive legends, right? We always want need legends whenever it's not obvious what the visual encoding, um, like what the scale of the for the visual encodings is. Um, and we can use these visual uh, these legends also to manipulate the visual encodings. So here in this case, we have these like. Uh, bubbles and we can show what like a small, lower bound and a higher bound is and we can manipulate um, the, like how this is scaled basically um, our scales by interacting directly with these smart interactive legends. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move on to aggregation which is going to be the bulk of uh, today's lecture. Um, so the idea of aggregation is um, to have a group of elements uh, represented by a typically smaller number of derived elements. So let's think a little bit about why do we want to aggregate data. Yeah? There's uh, too much data to visualize otherwise. Yes, um, that's one way, but we could also, in theory, do like just an overview of everything, right? But in statistics, all that I need You're interested in statistics? I couldn't hear the last part. Well, what that means, that Over a range, yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of like getting it at it. We want to aggregate, we want to kind of like have an overview, we need to deal with large data, but we also want to see the structure, we want to kind of like, um, not just have like one summary of everything, but instead we want to preserve, preserve the structure of our data set. So this is like your classical, like for numerical data, this would be your classical aggregation. We show simply a distribution uh, of the values in the histogram. So who wants to try to ex explain what a histogram is? It's fairly simple, right? Yeah. Basically bins. Uh, certain data together and then so that you have fewer. Exactly. Uh, so we have data uh, at the scale of 0 to 80 um, and then we bin them into these bins. Um, and like what's the, what are the big choices that I have to make when I create a histogram? Bin size, yes. That's the key thing and that's tricky to do. So here is like, okay, I'm assuming that Histograms are not particularly hard to grasp, but this is a very nice interactive visualization of a histogram. So you kind of like um, gather data items and you sort them into lists. And then you essentially, this is the binning process here. Um, and then according to the binning process, you, you um, assign them to those bins here. So that's a very simple representation of, of, of a histogram. Okay, so like, take a look at this on your own time, but I think this is fairly obvious. Um, so the tricky thing about histograms is the good number of bins is hard to predict. So the simple solution here is to make the bin size interactive and let the user play with it and choose it. That's kind of like um, reasonable, uh, but also of course a little bit cheating, right? Because you uh, rely on, on the human uh, to make those judgments, but you will see that there are good reasons to do so. And there is a lot of rules of thumb out there. What is a good bin size? So for example, the square root of n, where n is the number of elements in your data set, or log two of n plus one, um, and so on. These are all kind of estimates for uh, what could be a good bin size. But all of these estimates make an assumption about the underlying distribution. And so if you have a wacky distribution, uh, like some kind of rule of thumb is not gonna help you uh, to do that. So here um, we have, for example, two histograms with different bins. Um, these are, let's say, passengers and public transport, um, or yeah, in, in public transport. And we can see, like in the top one here, we kind of see that like there is it seems like there is 
not a lot of uh, people that are um, under 20, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of variation between children under 10 and uh, children between 10 uh, and, and let's say 18. Um, but if we have an increased number of bins, we can see that there's actually like probably a fair number of babies in this passenger uh, and, and this number of passengers, whereas um, like uh, there's few toddlers. Like I don't know exactly what the data set was, but uh, you kind of see that we don't see an outlier um, well um, in, in the case where we have not enough bins. Kind of like this is an important effect, right, of the data set that we are missing uh, in the original one uh, where we have where the bin size is too big. Um, this is a histogram of uh, how many calories people usually uh, eat at Chipotle. Um, so here is your recommended daily allowance of 2,000 calories and some single dishes or some orders are actually bigger than that. You can see that most burritos have between 900 and 1,000 calories and then we have these bumps which are kind of like additions of guacamole to your meal. Um, so the point of this here is, like, and there's like a, a nice um, article about this um, and on the New York Times, uh, but you could in theory also essentially have uh, unequal bin sizes. Uh, here is an example of how that would look. So you kind of see that there is like this, 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 this strong peak here uh, for uh, these like about like standard burrito, I would say, uh, and then there are these like valleys. But I frankly haven't seen like these unequal bin width uh, histograms in practice. Uh, they seem to be they can be useful if the diet data is very sparse in certain regions. Uh, and then in others, uh, but like I'm not particularly convinced that they're super useful. Um, a very related techniques are density plots or currently density estimations. Um, and so the idea of density plots or KDEs uh, is that you kind of like have a function that takes into account like not just like a discrete bin, but some kind of smoother function that takes into account uh, the underlying data here. So here we have two. Um, different representations, like here uh, uh, in, the, in the background here, a histogram and the KDE on top, um, and then uh, a KDE on top of these like line plots. And here is like a an interactive tool that actually is fairly um, useful. So here is like a distribution of data that we've collected, um, and currently density estimation is really about like here would be like a KDE uh, with a specific kernel. Um, blue line here. And what you need to choose, like the bin size in uh, histograms, you need to choose your bandwidth uh, and also your function uh, in kernel density estimation. But the bandwidth here is the most important thing. And I can manipulate the bandwidth, which will kind of see, it will directly result in like smoother or less smooth results. Basically, if you have zero bandwidth, uh, then you get basically the pattern of the underlying uh, data. But if you increase the bandwidth, you get very, very smooth behavior. And so it's not obvious necessarily uh, what is the right choice. This is similar to uh, when we talk about uh, histograms. It's like you need to look at your data, you look at the specific distribution. So this kind of like here shows you how the bin is calculated. The red line here, I hope everybody can see that. The red line here is kind of like uh, how um, our function works. So basically, elements that are right under the peak um, of that um, uh, of that function are, get a high value to represent the, the line at this point. Um, whereas there is the, these elements here still are considered in the calculation, uh, but are less important. Um, and so you can see how um, like the curve is static, and you can see that effect um, on the uh, on the KDE curve directly. And so again, if we change the bandwidth here, we see how that curve changes. So if we make this a very narrow bandwidth, uh, this is how our curve changes. And now uh, these are the elements that we consider for calculating the height at this particular point here. Um, we can use different functions, like this is a, like one uh, particular function, the Epanechikov or whatever the name is, you can use like a normal uh, distribution to do that, 
which kind of smooths it a fair bit. We can like, okay, we can always change our bandwidth and our amplitude here. Um, or we could use a uniform distribution so that we kind of like, this kind of results in these rugged values um, or we can do something like a triangular uh, distribution. So all of that um, is possible for calculating these KDEs. So here's a little quiz. Here are like, this, this protocol is called the lineup protocol, um, where we try to see whether people, like subjects in an experiment, can tell apart one from the other. So here are 19 charts were like or 19 KDEs and 19 dot plots that are drawn randomly from a normal uh, from a Gaussian, um, and one of those charts has 20% of samples with one identical value. So kind of like a very obvious outlier. Which one is the outlier? Bottom left. I hear bottom left. Other opinions? What's that? The middle row right column. The middle and the right column, this one here? Other opinions? Top left. Top left. Okay, so is that easy? It's kind of like there's a lot of interpretation happening here. Right? And um, if you look at the dot plots on the right, do you make the same judgment? Like in both cases, like bottom left is correct. Um, you kind of see there is a peak here, uh, but you kind of see that there is a peak here a little bit better, right? Um, and, and so this is a paper um, from this year's Infamous Conference by Michael Carell um, and his colleagues, where they kind of try to like evaluate how well suited those um, summary visualizations are uh, to identify certain kinds of artifacts and maybe like adversarial um, data sets. And so they evaluated a couple of things like gaps in distributions, outliers, and spikes. And they evaluated a number of different encodings, including KDEs, histograms, and dot plots at different bandwidth or bin size or transparency. And um, I would say the results are fairly like, um, they have results, but they are, there's not like one solution for everything, right? There are things like uh, spikes are easier to spot uh, in these dot plots, gaps are easier to spot um, if you have a histogram and the correct bin size, and so on. So it's kind of like complicated and tricky. Um, and I guess the best takeaway message from that paper that we can get is that these um, data flaws are difficult to detect with these summary visualizations. And if we, if we have reason to believe that those might exist, we really have to experiment with different summary representations to really like, be sure that there are no major data flaws. And these are like, not necessarily adversarial, but like, it's not uncommon right, that you have some kind of misreading or some sensor doesn't work or some col column was copied over and you have the same values a couple of times. Um, so these errors, they happen all the time. Um, and it's not clear that you would detect them uh, if you use these aggregate visualizations. So one other technique to visualize the distribution are box plots. Um, they are also called box and whisker plots. Um, I'm sure everybody here is familiar. Like one principle that you should always follow when you use a box plot is, well, let's, for, let's look first at what is, what is a box plot itself. You have here like a normal distribution at the bottom. Um, and the box plot shows you the median as a thick line in the middle. And then the interquartile range, like the values between Q1 and Q3 in the box. And then uh, Q1 minus 1.5 interquartile range is what the whisker is. And so you kind of see how that maps to like, our distribution here. Um, note that there is no like, strict standard on how these box plots are, uh, are constructed. So you should, like this is kind of the, let's say, most common way but you should always look at what uh, an author, if they use a box plot like this, what they actually specify the whiskers and the, uh, and the boxes to be. Um, 
Obviously, um, box plots have uh, some like shortcomings. They are not very useful for non-normal distributed data, and they're especially bad, bad for bi or multimodal distributions. So here is like one box plot with four distributions, all resulting uh, in the same box plots. This is kind of similar to Anscombe's quartet, right? Uh, we have basically same stats, different graphs. Um, and uh, like in, in a variation of uh, the box plot is the notch box plots. And here the notch is supposed to show you the uh, confidence interval. Um, so uh, by that definition of the confidence into, of, of the notch, you get those 95% confidence interval, and they're kind of like a rough guide to what we would call like statistical significance. So if you see like those notches not overlapping between two different conditions, um, you have reason to believe um, that there is some, like, I, yeah, I don't want to talk myself into about statistical significance here, but that's kind of like an indication that there's a real effect in the data. Um, here are a couple of, uh, well, first, uh, I like this comic, I'll give you a couple of seconds. <laughs> so, uh, the point here is that you should always plot your outliers. Um, because, like, here we have a couple of, like, different distributions. Um, I think you have a, yeah, so. Here you see like the, the, the corresponding distributions, right? So for an exponential distribution, we would get a box plot like this, and kind of like that's hard to like understand that this box plot, the blue one here, represents this exponential distribution. It's kind of like at least in my head doesn't work like that. Uh, the normal distribution works about as we expect. Again, the uniform distribution, the box plot doesn't really communicate that this is a uniform distribution. Um, and I guess the Poisson is fine. Uh, but it doesn't also show us these uh, step sizes. And why shouldn't you use uh, bar chart with error bars? Within the bar bias. Within the bar bias, yes. It's one big thing and it's kind of like, um, it's much better to simply show uh, like distributions with plots that are made for distributions and not with error bars just because um, bar charts and the error bars are easy to make. Um, this is kind of like uh, to hone in on that point here, like bar charts versus dot plot comparison. Like if you look at controls and patients uh, here, it looks like, um, let's say you have two conditions and it looks like basically there is no significant difference, right? Basically, if you just looked at those, uh, at those two data points, it, it looks like there's nothing happening here. Um, but if you actually plot this uh, with dot plots, you can see that there is kind of like a range for the controls, but that the patients group into two clusters. So we have this bimodal distribution, which you completely could not see in here. And that bimodal distribution, if these are patients, would kind of indicate that we actually have patient subgroups. So per, like for example, uh, certain people of, let's say, males, uh, that drug works well for males, but doesn't work well for females. And that's something that we would easily spot uh, if we plotted it like that compared to uh, in a bar chart. Um, a violin plot is kind of like a fancy version of a box plot where you use like a probability density function uh, for the outline. Um, and so here are two examples of box plots, one with like a bimodal distribution uh, in the green case that you cannot spot in the box plot example, but you can easily spot uh, the bimodal distribution in the violin plot. Um, and those are like available in all the standard charting packages like um, ggplot or matplotlib. Um, when you try to show uh, an expected value and an uncertainty, um, there is like this study again about error bars and bar charts. Uh, also again from Michael Corral, I have a couple of his uh, papers in this talk to, or in this uh, lecture today, um, where we see a couple, they evaluated different approaches to visualize uh, an expected value and the margin of error for that. Um, and they showed that these two representation here at the right um, like produce much better results of actually conveying the data uh, to subjects in an experiment 
than the other two here. Yeah? It seems like my own plots fix a lot of the problems with box plots, but don't introduce new problems. We just always use them instead. Uh, yes, but <laughs> they're trickier to create, right? Um, so, yeah. Symmetry make it easier to read than just having a probability distribution with a line edge? Uh, the symmetry makes it easier. Um, yes, I think that's more of a design choice. Um, I think the symmetric kind of like I think it would just look odd. I think that's more of like an aesthetic choice. I think it would work just fine. Um, I guess one thing that speaks against violent plots is that they probably need more space. Um, so like um, you use box plots frequently. Like here, clearly, violent plots are much preferable. But um, in a lot of cases, you have. Um, like box plots, like 50 box plots next to each other, right? And if you have 50 violent plots next to each other, um, it gets trickier to see. But by default, I would say violent plots, um, they are less easy to implement, they are less common, people might not understand them as well, but generally they are the better uh, visual encoding for distribution. So I, I personally use box plots a lot when I don't have, like I prefer actually histograms uh, or KDEs if I have space. Um, and then basically actually when you do a violent plot that is aligned, as you suggested earlier, you have a KDE or like a histogram uh, f fundamentally. Um, and I use box plots a lot when I have a lot of um, aggregates to show at the same time. I'll actually show some examples next lecture where we aggregate um, in, many, many, in many rows at the same time. And then box plots are fine, especially if you know the characteristics of the distribution, uh, that they're kind of like a uniform distribution, then it is clearly a, a decent choice. So aggregation in 2D would be, um, we, we, uh, we've seen some of this, but like the problem that we have with, if we have scatter plots like that, we kind of have overplotting here, which we could solve uh, with transparency to some degree, but another way is to create like a grid um, and, and bin essentially create those 2D um, histograms or 2D density plots. Um, and, and that kind of like is now, like it doesn't matter how many source points I have, right? I can basically see that in, in every case and I can easily scale that. Um, so here's this example, and I'm not gonna, this is live, uh, interactive. Um, I showed this before, data war, uh, where they use these kind of like um, bin scatter plots to actually visualize um, like a scatter plot matrix for a hundred thousand or a million data points in the browser. Um, you can also create these continuous scatter plots like that. So here is like from an experimental run on some engineering data set uh, where you have like a, a, like really a lot of data um, and, and that uses this kind of binning approach and this color coding to show what are the like high uh, density regions uh, in that scatter plot. Okay, so now I want to talk, about, like we've talked about um, aggregation of abstract data, now like uh, I want to talk a little bit about aggregation in a spatial context. Um, has anybody heard of the modifiable aerial unit problem? So the trick here is that if you try to make some judgments about some frequency in an area, how you choose the bins matters a lot. Um, here are like the same data points shown with different binnings, right? So here is a regular grid. Um, then here we have some kind of like that could look be that could be like a city map or something like that, where we have like the city and some suburbs split up. And here we have like a different distribute or a different grid. Um, and all of those grids by themselves look fairly reasonable. Uh, but of course, there is a lot of uh, like this looks quite different from that. Right here, it looks like uh, on this, this this example here, it looks like everything is practically the same. Here it looks like we have a massive peak in the middle of this map. Um, and so that's a problem because we have uneven distributions um, in, in, in these geospatial regions. And so there is no clear answer to that, how we best approach that. Regular grids are one approach, or an oil diagrams are one approach. Um, where you see that problem is in gerrymandering. 
Um, who knows what gerrymandering is? Okay. So, like, very hot topic in, in uh, politics and in the news. Um, so, what's the idea of gerrymandering? Is like people of different parties tend to not be evenly distributed across space. Like historically, Democrats um, kind of cluster in cities versus various Republicans cluster uh, in uh, rural areas. And so, how do we draw district lines to decide who gets like a congressman to represent them? That's the question, and that kind of like is how you need to define like a continuum or a, a region on the map uh, that makes the difference. And so uh, here is a simple example on, on a square grid. So we have like three different ways to divide 50 people into five districts. So we have 60% blue, 40% red. Um, if we do like slicing uh, in this perfect representation, uh, we have um, all reds in one cluster, all reds in the second cluster, and then uh, uh, three times all blue. So here, blue wins. This is, uh, uh, well, a special case, I would say, that's not very realistic. Here's a compact but unfair representation where we kind of like choose the district such that the blue ones have a slight advantage uh, in every single district. And so, in this case, blue wins via 5 to 0 compared to 60 40, what their actual distribution of votes are. Um, but this representation, like compactness, is usually a goal in, in, in drawing these kind of districts uh, because we want to have some special context. Um, so th this is compact, but it's not fair, clearly. Um, but you can also make red win in that case by drawing um, a non-compact spatial distribution. And so here you can see that <coughs> like there is this like snake-like curve going through this data set. Um, that kind of makes it such that the blue ones win a couple of districts with an overwhelming majority, but the red ones have a slight majority in many other districts. And so that's how gerrymandering works, by essentially binning your opponents in clusters that they win with an overwhelming majority, and kind of slicing up the rest of the districts such that you have a slight edge uh, in most of them. And this is an example of how that looks like in an extreme case, right? So this is clearly not a compact district. This is in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, I don't think that's the current, like, I don't think that's the current map because there was a Supreme Court or like a court ruling um, that this is unconstitutional. Uh, but this was a real district in Pennsylvania where Democrats in Pennsylvania in 2016 won 51% of the vote, but only five out of 18 House seats. Um, it's not like we don't do that in Utah. Um, so here, this is the uh, district map of Utah on, um, up to two, 2002. And so, um, why is this? Why was this redrawn in 2002? Another seat. What's that? We got another seat. Yes. So you got another seat. Um, like every 10 years, there's the U.S. Census uh, that happens again in 2020. Um, and after two years after that, they're usually ready to retraw the congressional districts based on the new, um, and the new distribution of people. Um, and so this was the, the map that was valid until 2002. And you kind of see that we have like Salt Lake City here as one uh, district, and then we have the uh, east and the west essentially separated into two other districts. And of course, what happened here historically is that very frequently, Democrats won Salt Lake City and the urban area, and Republicans won the other two districts. And so what happened is that like, this cluster of Democrats was sliced up neatly into, three, uh, into, th into, four, uh, into four different districts uh, at the, uh, in, the, in the latest map. So you can see that the one, two, three, uh, and uh, fourth district here all meet in Salt Lake City, and Salt Lake City actually slices up uh, the, uh, the city, like, the, like I said, I'd say majority liberal voters into four pieces so that they're packed in with a majority of conservative voters. Uh, and that meant that until like two weeks ago or so, you did not have a Democratic representative in Congress uh, because of that gerrymandering, which they usually had until 2002. Uh, so that's a real problem, uh, and as, if you follow politics, uh, there was a proposition that passed uh, in Utah that in the future redistricting was going to be uh, like a bi or like a nonpartisan committee, and so it's not going to be 
partisan slicing such that you um, like select who your voters are, but it's going to be supposedly run by a nonpartisan committee. Um, here is kind of like the sole like you know, uh, some other website, Daily Cause, made a congressional uh, elections map of Utah based on the 2016 elections um, with the current map where we had outcome four Republicans and like a hypothetical nonpartisan map. Uh, and you can see that there would be one Republican representative uh, for Utah in, these, in this hypothetical nonpartisan map. Um, so, uh, one way to slice um, space are Voronoi diagrams. And Voronoi diagrams are essentially asking given a set of locations, for which area is a location N the closest? So, think of this as the dots here being airports. Um, and you want to think about, like, I'm flying a plane, uh, and I'm in distress, and I need to get to the closest airports. Um, the color of the area you're in tells you immediately which is the closest airport for you. So, like, if you look here, um, if you're, like, on this edge where my mouse pointer is here, it is the closest to fly to this dot here, stay within the color. So you never cross the color <laughs> boundary. If you're somewhere here, it's the closest to fly up here. If you're here, it's the closest to fly to the right. So that's the idea of a Voronoi diagram. It's kind of like an area, it contains area of shortest distances to um, a specific point. Um, these Voronoi diagrams are well supported in B3. There's a specific layout for it. Um, and here is the, this example with World Airport um, by Jason Davids, uh, Davis in B3. Um, and so you can see that um, where are the closest airports from any given location in the world? You can see the non-surprising that we have a lot of airports in the east, eastern seaboard, and then fewer of them uh, in the west. But if we kind of like scroll into the ocean, like essentially if you're flying somewhere around here and have engine trouble, uh, that is tricky because you have to go really far to find an airport. Um, and he actually also, like you can see that like where there are, where there is, uh, like there's no airport, no airports in, Ar in Ar Antarctica. Um, and so he also identifies the point um, that is the furthest away from any airport here is being in the middle of uh, Antarctica. So Wordnoy diagrams are useful for many different things. Uh, one thing that is great about them, and that's kind of like a side note here, um, they're great for spatial aggregation, but they are also great for interaction. Um, so let me show you this example. One problem that you have often when you create a visualization is that you have, and the marks tend to be quite small, and they're tricky to point to. That's especially true for like little points as in the scatter plot, but also for lines in the line chart. So you probably have like, experienced that, that it's really tricky to select a specific line um, with your mouse. And so the idea of these Voronoi, um, of the Voronoi backing here, is that I can simply get close to the point um, and I will automatically select the closest point. So see that I don't actually like, point, I don't actually point to the dot that I'm selecting, I'm just in the proximity. Um, and that works fairly well, like this is kind of a very intuitive way of interacting uh, with it. Um, here is like the same scatter plot where I have to explicitly click it, and then down here I see the Voronoi tessellation of that um, scatter plot. Um, here is another example for a line chart by Mike Bobstock. Um, so here, like this is really cool because I can basically just like scroll anywhere uh, or move my mouse anywhere and I will always select something and it's always going to be the closest point on that line. And so we can look at how that looks in the background. Um, and so these are these areas of selection that these Voronoi cells define. So you can see that there are like these, there's like, I can move my mouse here uh, without changing the position. But if I move it slightly over here, it will actually change position. And this is like a really neat way to, um, uh, to interact with uh, elements that are kind of tricky to pick uh, by themselves. So how do we create a Voronoi diagram? Well, you can just use the D3 layout, but uh, behind the scenes what happens? Um, 
you need to calculate a Delaunay triangulation. Uh, and that is a triangulation where none of the vertices in a circle uh, um, are in a circle described by the vertices of a triangle. So um, this here kind of explains it. The black dots here are what I'm trying to connect in this triangulation. Um, and I'm drawing these circles. Like here is an example. I'm drawing like the circle, like basically that fits my 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 mo my uh, focus here. Uh, that circle goes through those points, and there is no uh, no other point that is in that circle. And so, um, if I do that, I find um, the center of the circles here are what I then use for the Voronoi uh, triangulation. So I connect these up uh, for the Voronoi triangulation. So that's a, like a fairly simple algorithm um, that you can calculate very efficiently to construct the Voronoi diagram. Okay, so now I want to do a design critique. Um, you can go to the website that I put on here. Um, it's an interactive tool, so I recommend you play with it. <laughs> 
Okay, so what's the data we have in this visualization? What are the marks, points, and what, what do those points correspond to? Artists, painters. Artists, painters, I've selected the musicians they have set here. So in this case, it's musicians? Yeah, musicians. Yeah. Okay, um, and what is the, what other data is, is, is in this chart? I don't know, there's like influence, I think, which is just like similarity. I guess. Um, there's influence and there's similarity. Um, what else? Time. Time, yes, when they were active or born. Anything else? I couldn't tell, but it seemed like the color was genre, like music genre for musicians, but that's kind of what it seemed like, but there wasn't anything like indicating that. Okay, so yeah, what could the color be here? Genre. Genre is, is like one hypothesis, but, well, at least, yep. Just something to show different data, you know, different points, I guess, because there's no explicit encoding. It looks like it just varies yeah. by position. It seems like it's coordinated with the time. The time? Do you think so? It's the time view. I think there are some trends, uh, but this looks very continuous here, right, in this map. So just like what I think what they did here is they have essentially space is redundantly encoded with color. Um, so I don't think that color means necessarily genre. Um, I think it kind of probably has a relationship with genre, but it's not clear cut. So one thing that I heard earlier here was significance. How is significance encoded? Size. The size, exactly, the size of the bubble. And so, um, then I heard um, influence, and like influence, well, let's maybe uh, do this, or do the very popular, Okay, let's say um, Aretha Franklin. Um, so we have influence, and what types of influence do we have? People who influenced her, and then people that she influenced. Yes, exactly. So we have influenced by and uh, influenced another artist. And so that's basically what kind of data structure? A graph. Uh, directed. Yeah, it's a directed graph, correct? Um, also, what's the data structure like that we see that's independent of the, the clicks here? What do you think is like encoded in the underlying data if, if I ignore the links? <coughs> it's a scatter plot, yes, but what is what is X? What is Y? Nothing in particular, but what, what is meaningful in this plot, what do you think? Location. Location, but is, it, is location by itself meaningful? Like, does the position of this dot, if I ignore everything else, mean anything? No. No, so it's really about similarity. Uh, and that's like what's called the projection technique here. Like we will talk more about this, but there's like a couple of things that we'll talk about today, like PCA, multidimensional scaling, TSNE, these are all projection techniques. And what do you use these kinds of projection techniques for? It's like what's the data we have? Like suppose we have, like here we have the beetles. How do we know that they are similar uh, to let's say the birds or the Ramones in some way and are, um, let's say, um, not very similar to Kraftwerk. Like the missing name characteristics. Exactly. We have like a large vector of attributes about those artists. So it's basically what we what we have here is like a breakdown of a very high dimensional data space um, into a 2D projection where we kind of don't show anything about the details of about what is in those data vectors anymore, but we only have a global measure of. Um, of similarity. 
Um, so why do you think is the network only shown when I click? Yeah, it would be a gigantic hairball. Like these are, like uh, these are all very connected. So let's suppose I would I would ask you to do this as your class project. Where would you get the data? <coughs> Any ideas? Wikipedia. Wikipedia, yeah. We're thinking it might be the IMDb kind of online algorithm database. Yeah, so um, what, like, Wikipedia would be an option, something like IMDB. What this was, this particular paper used Freebase. Um, Freebase was like a graph, like a knowledge graph of the world, essentially. It had all kinds of notes and, and things uh, in there. And it was eventually purchased by Google, and Google makes it now available as the, in their Google Graph API. So you can actually retrieve uh, notes and relationships like this. So this is like a structured um, knowledge graph. Um, I'm not actually sure how freely the Google API is available, but Freebase was a very like, um, popular data source, kind of a structured data source. Wikipedia would be a little bit less structured, so you would have like more, like a harder time writing a proper parser for Wikipedia uh, than you would have with this one. Okay, so let's compare the timeline to the similarity view. Like what are the, like here we see that there's like there's a color pattern here, but it's not completely consistent, right? Um, so which tasks do those views address? Let's suppose what what, the, what task does the timeline view address? The time aspect, yes. <laughs> um, so like one thing that's interesting. Let's suppose I click on uh, on the beetles here. Like what would like what okay the choices here are, are are interesting right so the way they routed the links is they they chose to route all of the links that influence the beetles below the axis and all the links that the beetles influence above the axis um, and so what's what's weird about this? How did the beetles influence the band in the nineteen thirties? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so what would be the answer? So. They, they influence that artist after they appeared, but the artist had yes. recorded records. Exactly. So these careers are not just points on the timeline, right? They like this guy here, Simon, clearly had a career that spanned until at least here because he was influenced by the people. That's kind of an oddity about um, about that. So let me switch to the philosophers here. Um, is there anything that you notice about the scales? So the time scale seems to be based off of uh, density of data points? Exactly. So we have a nonlinear time scale which is based on density of data points. Um, and we can see that like for philosophers, like we have but at least we have better records for people who were active, let's say, after 1800. And basically all of before 1800 gets like a third of the space, all of after 1800 gets two thirds of the space, even though we have uh, like important philosophers um, before that, or this is painters actually. So philosophers, I think it's even more extreme. Like here you have very influential Plato um, and Aristotle, and then you kind of see that there was kind of like a dark age of philosophy somewhere in here, uh, as is indicated by those many axes. Um, and then we see that there is like um, Wittgenstein being an important philosopher in the, uh, born in the 1870s or so. Okay, so any opinions? This is a good visualization. What's anything that's bad about it? One of the issues I had with the musician aspect is that they didn't even include Queen on there. <laughs> <laughs> they did not. Did you search? I did. I did. I did. I did. It's it's an incomplete data. <laughs>
Yeah, it's also hard to have the impact of Kant nowadays, right? <laughs> like, I think like academic fields, this is great about computer science because it's so young, uh, but we, we have like new technology that opens up new research fields all the time, but things like mathematics or philosophy, basically people have very, very similar tools to discover new stuff and, and make new contributions like 2,000 years ago. Uh, and of course, like if you had a brilliant insight 2,000 years ago, uh, it's going to have a lot more impact than if you have like a, like a subtle detail inside um, some sub area that we haven't thought about yet today. So that's great about CS compared to math. Right? <laughs> yeah. So like, okay, my personal opinion is this is like I, I really enjoy this data here, and I really like this visualization. I think it's very well done for what it is. Is this like Obviously, this is more casual, right? This is not something that you would um, like need to make decisions, but we'll see that you can use these projection techniques um, also to make very important decisions. So for example, um, projection techniques like this are nowadays like used a lot in machine learning to kind of like do some like understanding of what, what the data that you're trying to learn on looks like. Um, and, and it's of course um, imperfect, uh, but um, it's a very common thing to do. Any comments before we move on? Okay. So the first um, kind of like unsupervised method I want to talk about is clustering. So what is clustering? Who's taking the... Yeah. You group similar things together. Exactly. You group similar things together usually into discrete bins. And if you think about, uh, let's say, data mining methods, what distinguishes uh, clustering from, let's say, decision trees? What clustering, you don't know the answer beforehand. You're kind of guessing. Exactly. So it's an unsupervised technique. Like in supervised machine learning techniques, I have a label um, or some kind of, like, uh, let's say, the value for the regression. Uh, and when you do clustering, you don't know the answer beforehand, and so you're kind of trying to find groups in the data set without knowing, like from training data, what similar groups look like. Um, so you don't have any ground truth data if you use clustering. And clustering um, kind of is really important in, in a lot of visualization applications. I would say that probably half of my papers um, have some clustering aspect to it, uh, because it just helps us to with all of these problems of aggregation and sorting and so on. So um, clustering class uh, is the classification of items into similar bins, and that's usually based on some kind of measure of similarity. And that, that is, of course, very data dependent. You could have something like a Cleveland distance, person correlation, or you could have a measure for categorical values or the, the edit distance between strings or anything like that. Um, I would say there is four major types of algorithms. There's partitional algorithms, which divide the data into a set of discrete bins. Uh, typically, the number of bins is, here, is manually set, like in k-means, or automatically determined, like in affinity propagation. Um, usually, that is, you can influence that with some parameterization. Um, in contrast to partitional algorithms, which create these discrete bins, uh, we have hierarchical algorithms, which essentially produce a similarity tree where we have like a relationship and we can kind of cut that similarity tree at arbitrary points to create a discrete version of our clustering. So uh, these hierarchical algorithms, they kind of give us a good sense of how related specific items are. Um, then another type of clustering is bi-clustering, where you cluster both dimensions and records simultaneously. So like usually we think about clustering one or the other separately, but there are also methods that cluster both dimensions and records simultaneously. And then I guess um, for many applications, it's quite important to fuzzy clustering, which allows the case kind of like um, the occurrence of elements in multiple uh, clusters and some usually some kind of numerical score of how well um, a dot fits or like a data point fits into a particular cluster and can hence be in multiple clusters. Um, I think that a lot of real world problems um, are actually fuzzy um, and so fuzzy clustering is a good model to think about the world. Still it's not very popular. Why do you think that it is? <laughs> 
it's kind of tricky to visualize fuzzy clusters and to work with fuzzy clusters. So kind of like uh, discrete or hierarchical uh, partitions give us like a sense of, hey, this is neat, we can bin this, um, this works well. Fuzzy clusters don't do that as well, which is kind of like both a pro uh, uh, and a con. Um, so yeah, I think there is still a lot of work to be done in, in database for fuzzy clustering. We talked a lot about where we can use clustering already, but just to recap, we can use clusters to order. Um, we can use, like for example, in pixel-based techniques, like in heat maps, we want to like make sure that all of the elements that are in a cluster are adjacent to each other. That doesn't necessarily mean the exact order, but at least they have like every element in the group has to be next to each other. Um, uh, we can use them uh, to brush if we have um, geometric techniques. We can also use these clusters to aggregate. So, for example, um, if we um, want to represent the elements of a cluster as like just one single element, so that we have instead of having 500 elements in a cluster, we just represent the cluster centroid. Um, and um, aggregation here is really the idea of why we can use clustering for aggregation is because the clustering is such that the clusters themselves are more homogeneous than the whole data set. So if we cluster something together, we, we, have, we may have the assumption that the group in the cluster shares attributes and therefore we can faithfully represent it in some compact way. Um, uh, statistical measures, for example, like the mean of a cluster uh, is probably more meaningful um, than the mean of a whole data set because I will have multiple means um, and there will be like more, let's say there will be more, less error of a mean uh, if I take the mean of a cluster compared to the mean of a whole data set. Um, so that's why clustering is useful. Like here is a, a clustered heat map. Um, and I showed this picture before and the comparison to that uh, visualization where the clustering doesn't particularly help. Um, so you can see structure in this case, uh, but you can't really see much structure in this case. Um, this is like a paper that we did a long time ago. Um, and that's like, clustering is an imprecise science. It's like, um, we have a lot of different algorithms. We have a lot of different parameterizations. Some algorithms are actually randomly initialized, so they're not deterministic. Um, and hence, what we usually want to do is A, we want to measure how good is a clustering, and B, we want to compare different clusterings. Uh, and so this is kind of a technique where we compare different clusterings uh, for the same data set. Um, it has kind of some pull-out techniques, but you can see um, that the clustering is fairly inconsistent between those two um, examples. And here is another example where we take um, that, um, where we use clustering for aggregation. So here we create um, a couple of uh, like clusters for many different groups of dimensions and then represent those groups in a very abstract representation. So here you can see this is consistently low, this is low, low, and then high. And so the hypothesis behind that is that we can use this aggregate representation um, to faithfully represent a cluster which we couldn't otherwise do uh, in if we visualize the whole data set. Okay, so now I wanted to talk a little bit about k-means, but this is going to take more than two minutes, so I'm going to wrap it up. Just one last thing, um, I'm going to be, I have to go and leave for an appointment at 4 p.m. today, so if you want to come to my office hours, please make sure that you come right after lecture and come, come in after 4. Thank you, and see you all on Thursday.